Ken Bostrom Ministries. Beginning January 2018, Ken Boster Ministries engaged in a whole new assignment by entering the airwaves of the world. Don't miss Ken and Mary Boster Ministries Live. Welcome back to Ken Buster Ministries, where we reach the lost, teach the found, and we preach the word so that we can be united in his purpose. You know, God's pur one of God's purposes is that we align with his, his prophetic calendar. His prophetic calendar started in, in Exodus chapter 12. God's always had a calendar. The, the, the Hebraic calendar began in, uh, in Genesis chapter 1. And guess what? God's calendar has never changed. The dates, the, the, the times have never changed. Things have been added to it, like in Exodus chapter 12, when, um, when uh, that records Passover, that's when God started his prophetic calendar. These are, are called the fixed appointed time on God's calendar. And so God's got a day timer, just like we have a day timer, but on his day timer, he has marked prophetic things that that take us through um, th through the the times of Christ, his 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 um, his death, burial, and resurrection, the 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 oh, the beginning of the church in Acts chapter two, and the last days. What's going to happen in the last days? Those are fall feast. But will this be a historic Passover? You know, the first one in, in uh, Exodus 19 was historic. That's when, um, that was the giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai. That, that, that was historic. The second one is in Acts chapter 2. And uh, that's when the church began. And so let's look at some other names for Pentecost, Shavuot. That, that's a, the Hebrew word for, um, for this, this feast. And they call it Shavuot because that means weeks. There's seven weeks. It's called the Feast of Weeks. Uh, Pentecost actually is a Greek name, and it means 50, which is the days that they're counting. And when it comes to, um, to the feast as a whole, feast is Moedim. That is a word for fixed, appointed time on God's calendar. The first time we see it, is in Genesis chapter 1 verse 14 on the fourth day when when there was a sun and the moon and they would be for signs and for seasons signs and for seasons that word also is Moedim that these are the feasts of Israel these are the feasts of the Jews no these are the feasts of the Lord and the Lord said these are my feasts they're my feasts and keep them holy keep them separate from everything else and, and they're going to be convocations. That means it's going to be a dress rehearsal. When I was in high school, I, w I would be in, in plays, you know, school plays. And we would rehearse and we would rehearse, we would rehearse, so that when the actual uh, date of the play came, we would understand everything, where we're supposed to be, where we're supposed to say, and it would be so natural. We wouldn't have to ask, we would know. And these are things we should proclaim. And this is what I'm doing. I'm proclaiming. I'm heralding. I'm announcing that this is going to be a Pentecost to remember. And we should remember them in their seasons. And 1 Corinthians 10, 11 said, Now these things befell them by way of a figure as an example. Now he's talking, these things he's talking about were were everything that Jewish people went through in the wilderness. Actually, they're called Israelites back then. They weren't called Jews until they came back out of Babylon. Um, and, but the, the Israelites in, in the wilderness and how they would murmur and different things. And all these things are an example for us as an example and a warning to us. They were written to admonish and fit us for the right action of good instruction. We in whose days the ages have reached their climax, their consummation and concluding period. And this is in the Amplified Bible. 
And the God's Word uh, translation says they were written down as a warning to us who are living in the closing days of history. The King James uh, Bible says, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Um, New King James, upon whom the end of the ages have come. New Living Testament says, to warn us who live at the end of the age. Uh, the uh, NASB Bible, New American Standard Bible, the end of the ages have come. Now, ages, this word is telos, and that's where we get the telescope, where we can see something. It's a termination of things. It's uh, a limit to get uh, things to cease to be, or it's a finish. It's going to be the finish of the world. It's going to finish. Uh, it's a period of time. There is a period of time that is set on God's day timer. And we are at the, at the end of the end. You know, uh, I talked on last, last, um, the last program about how I truly, truly, truly believe that 2017 was a dividing line in history. I gave you examples from Rabbi Ben Samuel in 1012, 17 B, uh, AD, he talked about the last 10 jubilees. Now, the last 10 jubilees, as he, as he uh, prophesied them, eight of them, uh, all 10 of them, were exact to the, to the year, exactly to the year. And uh, that started in 1517, 300 years after he died. And... Um, he said, after the last one, which was 2017, he said the messianic end times would begin. Now, I'm not going to talk to you about rapture or pre-rapture, post-rapture, mid-trib, any of those things. All I know is we are coming into times that we have never been in before. Um, 2017 was the 70th anniversary of the the nation uh, of the United Nation giving Israel back their land, it was the 50th anniversary as a jubilee of Jerusalem coming back into God's people. It was uh, the 100th anniversary of the Balfour Declaration, 70th anniversary of the Dead Sea Scrolls, 100th anniversary of the Catholic Fatima Declaration, 500th year of the the Reformation, and so. Uh, Dutch Sheets had said, I believe 2017, 2018 will go down in history as a turning point years for America. I believe it's going to be a turning point year for the world. I really do. We are living in the, if, 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 if they were saying back then, writing the New Testament, that these were the last days, then here we are, what, 1900 years later, 19, 1990 years after Christ was on, uh, after the uh, first Pentecost, that we are in the last of the last of the last. We must be in the last minute, the last second of the last hour. Amen? And so, you know, I, I, I was always taught dispensations. That's how I learned. And, you know, because God does things different. You know, as it, let's say administration was like a dispensation. Uh, you know, when the Obama administration um, ended, a new administration came in. And, and they had, uh, and that was Trump's administration. And, that we, and both of them had different ways of doing things. But they were different administrations. And uh, the first administer dispensation was innocence, is in the Garden of Eden. But then when, when Adam sinned, then they had a conscience. They knew that they were naked. And they came into the dispensation of conscience, where they know the difference between good and evil. And so that went all the way to the flood. Then after the flood, it was human government. And that was from the flood to Abram. And then that went to... Abraham with the promise, the, the dispensation of promise. That went all the way to Moses. And so that went from, so here we have four of the seven dispensations just in Genesis up to Exodus. And then from Exodus, from Moses, uh, he, that was the dispensation of the law. That goes all the way to Acts 2. And the, so the whole Bible is written for us, but it's not written to us. A lot of things in the Old Testament were written for a dispensation. You know, when I teach Bible college or Bible schools, 
I, I, and, I'm, and I'm talking about dispensations. I give them the example, where did Cain get his wife? And they think they're trying to, trying to figure that out. I said, he, he had to have married his sister. He had to have ch children with his sister. And that's why they were, they were populating the earth. They were the first family. Now, when you come to the dispensational laws, that is against the law. You know, th you can't marry your family anymore. They put that in the law and on Mount Sinai. And so it was different ways of doing things. There's different ways of doing things. And when we come into the grace dispensation, that's a church age, we are not treated like the Jewish people back in the Old Testament. We're redeemed from the curse of the law. And we're, by grace, we're saved. We don't have to work for it. We don't have to prove anything. We are saved by grace. And uh, after this age is done, it will come into the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ, which will be the seventh one. But I want to talk to you about the, the Passover, the Pentecost of uh, 30 AD. You know, Luke 24, 49 says, Behold, I send the promise of the Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem till you are endued with power from on high. And that we see that again in Acts chapter 4. You know, the promise of the Father seems like something strange to us, but it was not strange to them back then because they, had, they would have year after year, remember, they were supposed to keep the Passover every single year every single year, perpetually, uh, keep it forever, Leolam. And so here, what happened is they would have an afikoman. They would have the matzah bread, they would have three stacked. Now the Jewish people believe it stood for Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. But the Messianic Jews believe it stands for the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now the, the Son gets put in the middle that representing Jesus. And there's a special time during the dinner that the father will take out the middle one, he will break it in two, he'll wrap it in a cloth, and he will hide it. And at the end of the meal, then a child will look, the children will look for that afikoman, and the one that finds it goes to the father or the host, and they start bargaining. Uh, they start bargaining for a new bike or a horse or a new doll or something, they will start bargaining with the father. Now, the father, if he can't give it to him right then, like $10 or something, he, will, he has 50 days to fulfill that promise. That is called the promise of the father. Now, Peter was the one who found the cloth that, uh, that had Jesus in it. Jesus was the bread. He was broken for us. That's why we, on communion time, we break the bread because he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement or our peace was put upon him. And it's by his stripes we are healed. He was broken for us. His bones were not broken, but his body was. Our, and, his body wasn't broken, but he was absolutely wounded for our transgression. And, and, it, and when Peter went in, in Matthew 8, 20, 28, 6, it says, He is not here, for he is risen, just as he said. Jesus is not a liar. If he says he's going to come, he's going to come. If he said, told his disciples, I'm going to raise from the dead, they could take it to the bank. He was raised from the dead. Jesus is not a liar. He is not, a, he's not, God is not a man that he should lie. But Peter was the one that found the broken bread. Peter found the afikoman. John 26, uh, 26. So Simon Peter also came following him, entered the tomb, and saw the linen wrappings lying there with the face cloth, which was, had been on his head, not lying with linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. And so the other disciples who had first come to the tomb, they also entered, they saw and believed. But Peter was the one that found it. And Peter was absolutely, if you remember Peter, Peter was the one that he kept getting into trouble. He's the only one that was absolutely openly rebuked by Jesus. And you know, remember when, when Peter says, well, Jesus, you ought to not be saying all that stuff. And Jesus looked at Peter and he said, get behind me, Satan, because he was talking about 
the one that was putting words into Peter's mouth. Peter was the one that denied Jesus three times. You know, sometimes I think Peter was the one with the peppermint foot. His foot was always in his mouth. He was wanting to be, he was wanting to be good. He was wanting to do right. He was wanting to be covered in the dust of the rabbi, like the followers were of a rabbi would say. But, but he was always messing up. And you know what? I believe that J Peter, with all his heart, after he denied Jesus Christ, he said, God, I just want to be, I just want to be a voice for you. I just want to be a follower of Jesus. I, I don't want to embarrass you. I, I, I want to be a man of God. And, and look, what ha look what happened to him on Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come to pass, they were all in one accord and in one place. And suddenly, and I love that word suddenly, suddenly there came a sound from heaven like a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak with with other tongues as the spirit gave them utterance and and so peter absolutely he preached the best message ever in history and he was he was an ignorant fisherman he was an ignorant fisherman what had they been told to do what were their instructions before all this happened they said wait wait until the promise of the father um I think I have time here. I'm going to read. I'm going to read that because it, that whole whole chapter one is so good. And it, this is written by Luke, and it says the former account I made Theopolis of all that Jesus began to do and to teach, until the day in which he was taken up through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles which he had chosen, to whom he had presented himself alive for his suffering for many infallible proofs. You can't undeniable proofs being seen by them for 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God and being assembled with them he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem but to wait for the promise of the father see that's the promise of the father which which he said you have heard from me and and then it says verse 8 but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses in Samaria to the end of the earth. And then Jesus was taken up. And, and so what are our instructions for us today if this is going to be a Pentecost to remember? We have to get into a, into a, a, a position of waiting with our mind, with our thoughts, uh, finding, uh, just getting alone with God more, just getting, just waiting before him, uh, not with your agenda, not with your program, or anything else just wait before him and say Lord I am I, I love you I want you to talk with me you know because Jesus said my sheep hear my voice and he wants to impart into us and and he wants us to wait for him one of the things we can do when we're waiting is to go over prophecies that have been given to you reread those prophecies come into agreement with those prophecies and say, Lord, I haven't looked at these for a long time, but I'm, I'm looking at them now and I'm coming into an agreement with you. The promise of the Father, the promise of the Father um, is, is found in Luke's, uh, here, let me, let me put that on there. This is the promise of the Father and it shall come to pass in the last days, says God. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. That is, what's, that is the promise of the Father for us today because Peter said, this hasn't happened yet. Peter preached the most amazing message. 3,000 religious Jews were born again in one day from Peter just being endued with power from on high. He boldly spoke it. He was not afraid. He was not afraid. He boldly spoke it. And, and let me tell you, in these last days, we're going to overcome by the power of the blood and the word of our testimony. And we're going to boldly proclaim 
the good news of Jesus Christ so all men can be saved. But it said, here is the promise of the Father to us. You know, it says God there, and it shall come to pass in the last day, says God. But let me tell you, you know, they didn't know God as their Father. When Jesus said, I want you to pray like this, our Father who art in heaven, they were thinking like Abraham. <laughs> they were children of Abraham. They were servants of God. For them to call God their Father was just unheard of. And uh, But here, when we look at God, we think of Father. Because when you're born again, you know God as your Father. You know him intimately as your Father. And he says, this is my prom this is the promise for us today and it shall come to pass in the last days says Father God I will pour out my spirit on all flesh that is household salvation that I, I mean, I'm expecting calls I'm expecting calls saying I don't know what to do my your nieces and nephews are just laying on the floor prophesying and, and praying in different tongues I don't know what to do I'm going to say you know what happened I have answers to prayer this, this is what's going to happen you know in, in Joel chapter 2 he's talking about all the good things that were going to happen to Israel and then he said it's going to happen afterward it's going to happen afterwards. It's going to be the, after what I just said. But when Peter said it, he said, in the last days. He changed that one word. He said, it's going to happen in the last days. And uh, so, you know, these are something that happened in my last days. I graduated in 1967. And that's when the, the, the um, Jerusalem came back into the hands of the Jewish people. Now, what, ha what the Jewish people do on the night before Pentecost, they stay up all night and they read Ezekiel chapter 1, Ezekiel chapter 3, Ezekiel chapter 36, and, Ezekiel ch and, and Joel about the open heavens. And, and you just need to get just a notebook and start putting down everything, uh, all the prophecies, about, that are about the days that we're living in now. All the prophetic words. Let me tell you, Johnny Enloe has got an amazing one. Um, um, Ray Hughes at Gloria Zion Church had an amazing word about expecting sounds to come from heaven. Great expectation. Um, but what happened in 1967, that was the first time since 70 A.D., that they had been able to go to the Western Wall, the Western Wall, the hotel in, in Jerusalem, because they hadn't been able to do that since they had a nation. But they came back in, into, and so when, after all night long of, of reading the Bible, studying the Word, and anticipating a move of God, the heavens opening, they would go to the Western Wall. But guess how many people showed up at, at dawn? 200,000 Jews walked. See, there's no buses or anything because it's the Sabbath. All the feast days are Sabbaths, and buses can't run, elevators can't, you can't, you can't it's a Sabbath. And um, so 200,000 walked to the hotel as the day dawned. Can you imagine the tears that were flowing out of those rabbis as they were worshiping God? in spirit and in truth at, at that wall. Um, and so are we in the last days? You know, on January 1st, 19, uh, 1901, at Stones Folly in Topeka, Kansas, uh, Charles Parnham had, had uh, founded that school. There was a school there. There was a man named Fa uh, Stone, and he had built this beautiful mansion. Here's a picture of it. He had built that beautiful mansion, and um, he couldn't finish it. He ran out of money, so he just left it. And here comes Charles Parnham, and, and he, he takes it for a, a Bible school, Bible college. Well, how was he going to advertise a Bible college? You know what? The Holy Spirit advertised it because people started coming into the train station, getting off in Topeka, Kansas, and saying, where is the Bible college? I'm supposed to go to that Bible college. You know what? God, God has a way of opening up doors and, and a way where there seems to be no way. And um, 
And in 1905, oh, let me go back to uh, midnight on 1901. Uh, Agnes uh, Osmond, Agnes Osmond was upstairs in the upper room, upper room of Stone's Folly. And the, their, their school had been studying how to be endued with power. How do you get power? And they said the only way to get that power, that supernatural power, is to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And so at midnight, she asked Charles Parnham, lay hands on me and I will receive the Holy Spirit. She, here it was, midnight, January 1st. Uh, it was New Year's Eve, Jan so it was midnight, uh, it was the day was dawning. She was endued with power from on high. Absolutely endued with power from on high. And um, so it, all, all of them started speaking in tongues there afterwards. But she was the first one because she had been waiting in the upper room. Do you know the only people in Jerusalem, all that happened? And, but the ones that were waiting in the upper room were endued with power from on high. Agnes Osmond was the first one endued with power from on high, waiting in the upper room. But then it spread from there, and it came down to, to uh, Houston, Texas, came down to Galveston. He was going to start a Bible college there, but then he decided to go to Houston and start a Bible college. Well, he was teaching, and, uh, but the problem with Houston is they were so racially divided. There was a, a one-eyed black man that was from um, Louisiana, and his name was William Seymour. And he had to sit outside the door and listen to the teaching because he was not allowed to be in that class. He had to sit outside. And, and from there, he was called to California. Uh, they needed help out in California. And he's the one that started Azusa Street. So if you're racially prejudiced, you're going to mess revival. That's all I can say because God does not, he doesn't mess with color. Everybody is the same blood. And Father's Day in 1995, uh, Brownsville in Pensacola outpouring. And, and that was for five years that lasted. Four million people attended and brought revival back to their churches and cities. Amazing. Here's my last point in, in Johnny Enlow. In 2020, historical reset of the world. There's, there's been a lot of waiting at any time beginning Thursday evening, May 28th through Pentecost Sunday, May 31st. We can expect a sound from heaven like a mighty rushing wind that brings us the greatest baptism of the Holy Spirit since Acts 2. The word of God says, believe the prophets and you will prophesy. That's 2 Chronicles 20, 20, uh, 2, 20, 20, well, anyway, it's 2020. So God bless you. Have a great day. Amen. This is Ken and Mary Bostrom. We thank you for joining us today. We welcome you to watch us on KBNTV.tv, YouTube, Facebook, mbostrom2.com. Also listen to us on WRNO Shortwave Radio. Contact us at KenBostromMinistries.org. God bless you today.